Hey everyone, looks like the doors are closed so we'll kick off, might be a minute early but full room anyway. Um, the Windows 8 session's been pretty packed eh, it's pretty cool. Who's um, coded for Windows 8 in this room? Okay, who hasn't? Okay, who has no arms? Good. Oh, there's a guy down there, no arms, good, good. It's always one. Um, that's cool because uh, this is actually not really a, um, an absolute beginners. We're going to assume you know how to code C Sharp and XAML at least, and pr probably assume you know how to um, do a file on your project in Windows 8 and get started, and we'll take you from there. We'll just run through the intro. So why this session is awesome, okay, why you're going to love what you're going to see. First thing is it's Windows 8, and everyone knows Windows 8 is awesome. Uh, it's a way to make money with apps and a way to make cool apps as well. Uh, we're going to show you tips and tricks that we've learnt from building real apps. So you saw the apps I was playing with before, those are apps we've built. Those are two out of the many we've built. Um, we've got apps in the uh, Windows, phone, sorry, Windows 8 marketplace right now, uh, some of the pre-release stuff. And um, yeah, so as we've gone through and gone file new project ourselves, and then actually gone to a marketplace ready app, run through things like the application excellence reviews from Microsoft, dealt with many bugs, um, we have found out a lot of stuff and we're going to tell you, tell you what we found out and how we implemented those, so um, keep, keep an eye out. So who are we? I'll let Nigel introduce himself. So I'm Nigel Sampson, uh, I've been a developer at Market Metro since April and uh, basically been working on mostly Windows 8 apps, uh, you saw the Herald 7 Digital and so on, uh, you can reach me on Twitter at, at Nigel Sampson. Cool. And I'm Ben, uh, NZ Ben on Twitter. Uh, I've been doing Metro stuff since Mix 2010 when Windows 8 was, sorry, Windows Phone was announced. I keep getting confused with these two. Uh, and doing development for lots of years. And did, once did management as well before I didn't like it. So what are we going to show you? We're going to look at the default templates. We're going to look at that file new project and show you what's good and what's bad about it. And also how it helps you with the grid and how it doesn't help you with the grid and these sort of things. Um, Nigel's then going to go through some... Um, real world examples and how to understand how the grid view works, um, how to make it look good, uh, how to apply a semantic zoom, um, not necessarily how async await works, but how to deal with using async await in your project and how to deal with handling errors especially, that's something we've, we've had fun with, if you want to say fun in inverted commas. Um, then a little tip about theming with my hammer pants, I'll show you that, I don't know if I'll do an MC hammer dance but you have a look. Uh, and we'll have some tools and resources slides as well. The presentation will be available online afterwards, so the links in the presentation will be there for you. So let's start. Let's start as we always start with a file new project. So I'll show you... Um, oh, that's right. Let's talk through the grid first. It's a good point. Um, I talked about this yesterday, and you probably heard about the Metro or the Windows 8 grid a lot. Who knows about the grid? Yay, good, good. So um, the grid in, in Windows 8 obviously is made up of device independent pixels. So when I say one pixel, I mean device pixel. Uh, subunits and units, and those are laid out on the screen as follows. Okay. So most of the apps you see, the apps that I was playing with before, all the store apps, uh, everything pretty much apart from games will start to look a lot like this. Okay. With a, um, a 140 pixel top margin, a 120 pixel left margin. So just take, keep that in mind as I show you through what I'm going to show you now. So this is a, this is a file new project. It's the, um, the grid project, which shows you know, how things are laid out on the screen, gr grouped items. And I've done a couple of things to it, really minor things. One is I've added a link to XAML Spy, which is a tool we use to inspect the XAML as it's running. Okay? So that's, that's really irrelevant to the, how, the, how the thing's laid out. And I've also turned on selection mode in the, um, in the base grid so that you can see how you can select and unselect items. So just straight away, looking at this group de items detail page, if you understand XAML, scroll down, and you'll see there in the style, there's a, a, it looks interesting, a row definition of height 140, that sounds perfect. Okay, It's our top margin. But as you go further down, you'll see the grid view, which is where everything is contained, has a bunch of re really weird numbers on there, 116, 137, 40, and 46. So, so why are they not 120 or 140? And this is where I'll, um, I'll demonstrate how, how XAML Spy really helps us. So let's run this up. Okay. So like I said, I've got selection mode turned on, so you can select and unselect items. Everyone see that OK? So if I go to XAML Spy and just say Show Grid, you can see, again, this is something I showed yesterday. It's, it's perfectly on grid. It's really quite nice. The, the header baseline is perfect. There's a 140 top margin, 120 left, left margin. 
But those numbers, like I said, said 137 and 116. So, and, and you know, there's nothing else that we've added to that. These grid, grid items are pretty standard sizes and stuff. So let's do another thing that XAML Spy lets us do, select visual, and I'll scroll. So as I hover over things, it's showing me different elements. Okay. So I'll pick that one, I've just tapped on it, and switch into XAML Spy, and we'll see what really is going on. Okay. There we go. Okay, so our content presenter, our grid view item that we've templated, sorry. Let's have a look, this one here, there we go. So this grid here, um, I'll see if I can highlight it for you at the other ends of the room, but you can see that its height is 250 and its width is 250. And I'll just go back to the code and show that's what we've defined in the code. So let's scroll down here. Say uh, item template is a standard 250 by 250 item template, which is width of 250, height of 250. Okay. We'll go in here and see that that is applied correctly, but as we go further up the tree and look at the way things are, are grouped in here, there's a border, there's an outer container, there's a grid view item, and we start to see things like in the grid view item there's margins on there. 022, okay. Which was the other one, Mike, Nigel? You know. <laughs> Content border of 444 there, okay. And what that's doing is that, is that is supplying for us, out of box, things like these rollover highlights, okay. And when we select an item, the purple border and the, gri the selection glyph, okay. And that's what that's doing is pushing our, um, our grid items around a little bit. And that's why the, the default grid, the default layout, has given us, or has taken back, some of that space. So the, the, what's it saying is the grid is actually starting a little bit to the left of 120 and being pushed across by all the container elements that are being put in place to give visual feedback. Okay. So hopefully you understand that, and that's just me saying, um, you might need to do the same thing with your own templates if you're using standard templates and standard item containers. And so don't be afraid to tweak those numbers to get things to align perfectly. Does that make sense? Cool. So um, let's just dive a bit more into the, um, into the file new project and we'll talk about what we've learnt from this project and what is good and bad about it. Okay? There's actually a lot of good in here and there's a lot of good stuff that you can start from and, and work from. Uh, obviously the good is that the XAML is perfectly aligned. Okay? So that if you start from there and use those numbers and you start adding things to it, you should be able to stay on grid really, really nicely and will stay in alignment. Um, you know, the top, um, the top of the page there is quite the header, okay? So let's have a look, actually the header's down below. So the back button and page title, okay? So it's all bound up to frame, can go back, the back button there. So it shows and hides automatically. So on your home screen, your first screen, the back button is not there. On subsequent screens, when it detects a back stack, it shows up automatically. Uh, the page title is um, nicely styled up. Okay. Page header text style and back button style on the back button. So these are all cool things, all very nice. Um, the other thing that's great about it is Snap View or the support for Snap View is implemented. Okay. So if you look at down here further, You've got app, uh, with the visual state groups for, uh, in fact, portrait as well, but you've got filled and snapped, okay? Visual state snapped, and that's going to do things like change the size of your title, change the size of your back button, uh, and then you can optionally do things like what they're doing in this page is making the item list view visible and the item grid view collapsed. So that's actually swapping between a grid, grid view and a list view as you, as you toggle between the the full and snap views. Yeah. And the way that works is if we have a look at layout aware page, it has some really handy methods in there called start layout updates and stop layout updates. Okay. So it detects the changes between the filled and snap view and then fires a visual state manager go to state. So if you did a start from blank project or, or write your own project from scratch, you would have to build all of this yourself. But starting from the grid project or starting from one of these other ones, you get this, this things. 
The other useful stuff is um, the bindable base is just you know a basic iNotify property changed, but implemented quite quite nicely with some cool stuff like this caller member name in here. So you can basically just say set property uh, my local field and the value. You don't even supply the last one, and it works out that that was called from a property setter, and applies the right uh, raises the right notify property changed event for you. Nice little little helper method there. A um, couple of converters. The boolean to visible converter is really really useful. Okay, um, that lets you say the visibility on a control is bound to a boolean is visible. You know, you might have something in your view model that says is back button visible, for example, or is save button visible. And you apply this converter and it says, well, if it's true, then display, then return visible. If it's false, then return collapsed. Okay? So then you don't have to put special properties in your view models to say collapsed and visible. It does it all for you. Um, and of course, the standard styles that comes along with it. And that I showed you that earlier on in the grouped items page. When I went and looked at that 250 by 250 grid, okay, standard 250 by 250 item template, that is defined in standard styles, okay, and it's defined with a few bindings to image, title, subtitle. So if your view models have properties called image, subtitle, view, view sorry, subtitle, title, you can just throw them at this template and they'll render perfectly as a you know, a Windows 8 grid item in the right size and the right place. You can, of course, and what we tend to do is copy this out and paste it into our own styles like XAML and fiddle with it, make the properties more accurate, maybe change the size of the things within the 250 by 250, but leave the same outer size. So it kind of feels the same to users, but, um, but we get full customization over it. Yeah. Um, like I said, the, the good stuff comes with bad. I mean, layout aware page is pretty good as it stands. Um, the navigation helpers and layout aware page are also cool. The um, go forward, go back, go home. All right? So these are just prop, uh, methods you can call. So if your page inherits from layout aware page, you can just call these off, off buttons, that sort of stuff. What's not cool about this is the default view model. So who knows about um, MVVM in the room? That's good, okay. Most of you have a good understanding of MVVM. You know there's a, generally, you have a view model object behind a view and you can do interesting stuff in that view model object. You can you know, have properties that change colors based on the value of something else. This default view model, um, I don't know if the template writers were on crack, but I suspect they might have been. It's this thing called an iObservable match, which is just a, a map, which is just a string to object mapping, and they just throw stuff in there. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's easy, I guess, from a demo point of view for them to throw in demo data, but when you look at the way it, you know, the way it works, it's very, very restricting, and it's kind of a bad example to set where this page is data bound to a, um, you know, to a source of called groups, which I believe is on the layout. Oh, code behind. Code behind, that's right. Grouped items page, code behind. The groups there. Let's go down to uh, on navigated. That's right. Builds it up. There. there we go. Load state. Okay. And it just throws some sample data groups and it throws it into a default view model of type, you know, of string groups, sample data groups. So when you data bind something called groups, it goes and gets it back out again. You know, it's ha I guess it's it's a simple property bag, but when you go and build your own thing, and I do think, you know, credit to them, they've got a to do there saying, create an appropriate data model for your problem domain and replace the sample data. So they are hinting at that, but I, I do, I would suggest if you start from here, it's the first thing to throw away is that piece of code there and work with proper view models, view models that map to your views and give you much more flexibility than this sort of thing here. So that's, um, switch back to there. So hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what's good and bad about the default templates and file new project. And I'll hand over to Nigel now, he's gonna go to the next demo. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about for the next three demos are basically a couple of uh, ways you can improve these templates to make them look a bit more visually interesting, uh, hopefully make them separate from other people who have just gone file new template, and also some tips and tricks about uh, async await and how we can do error handling around that. 
So the first one we're going to deal with is the, uh, the grid view. Can we switch over? Yep. So what I've got here is the, uh, the seven digital app we built a few months ago. And as you can see, it's not quite the standard grid in that the first item in each group is slight, well, actually twice as big as all the rest. So this allows Seven Digital to, uh, to feature albums they want to sell a bit more heavily and hopefully drive a bit more business value. So we want to do this in our application. So what I've got he here is a grid view, much like a store. We've got different types of food and just some random things I thought up. So what we're going to do is make this a bit more visually interesting. This looks a lot like every other grid view you're going to see in Windows 8 demos. So we're going to try and break this up, make it more visually interesting, and try and sell some more pizza. So uh, who went to see uh, Nigel Parker's talk on Windows UI design yesterday? We got some. OK. So he talked about this in a demo, uh, quite a bit. So I r highly recommend going and seeing the video about this. Uh, and he talked a lot about, say, the golden ratio and how we can talk about sizes and bring this together. Uh, he did a lot better than I would, so uh, really go see that. So in our code here, we've got pretty much a standard grid view, a lot like Ben just showed you. We've got a virtualizing stack panel at the top there, horizontal. This is stacking each group next to the other. We've got a header template. It's not doing much. We've got a variable size wrap grid. So what this is doing is stacking each item vertically next to each other. When it gets to the bottom, it starts from the top again and starts stacking again. And the last thing we have is an item template here with a fixed width of height of 200 by 200, and it's just showing, showing our data for us. So the first thing we want to do is think of some business logic around how we're going to assign sizes to our foods. Um, if you're doing your own application, this might be, is the product featured? Uh, for 7Digital, it was, is it the first item in the group? For us, we're just going to do it pretty arbitrarily. I've got a method here called assign sizes. So I'm just saying the first item will be large, the next will be wide, the next will be standard, tall, tall, and standard. Now, this enum tile size is something I've created. It's nothing particularly special. But it's something for me to keep track of what size I've assigned each product. So the first thing we're going to do is loop over our category data. And assign sizes to each category's products collection. So we haven't done much. We've, all we've done is implemented our business logic of saying this product will be large, this product will be wide. So now we've actually got to deal with that in our XAML. So switching back to our, our store view now, we've got to move to our data template and remove the width and height out of our data template because we're going to have this data template scale to different sizes as per necessary. So all the work. We've got a light show going again. Someone's leaning against the light switch. <laughs> cool. So all the work's going to be handled by this control called variable sized wrap grid. Now, this is built into WinRT, and it's built around handling a grid where things are going to be different sizes. It's still a grid. So if you've done any Silverlight or WPF, you may have heard of a, con uh, a control called wrap panel, which basically just tries to lay out things as best as it can. Wrap grid works with the concept of a grid. It knows that there'll be rows and columns, and that items must be either 1, 2, 3, or x rows or columns wide. So what we're going to do is define how wide a column and row should be. So we're going to say item width is 300. And I went to a golden ratio calculator last night to work out what these should be. And the item height will be 185. So we've said. If something is one row by one column, it'll be 300 by 185. If it's two rows by one column, it'll be 300 by 100 and <laughs> 370. <laughs> Show my bad math right now. OK. So the way we, we define how wide these should be is through an attached property called uh, row span or column span. Now, the first thing I did, and the first thing a lot of people will do, is race back down to their data template and start trying to say, 
the row span or column span is something here. And that's not going to work. The reason is, is, as Ben showed using XAML Spy, it's not this grid that's in that panel. It's been wrapped by other stuff, in this case, a grid view item. So grid view wraps all these data templates with grid view items to handle things like selection, those hover borders. And it's those grid view items are what we're going to want to reposition. We're going to do that through styling. Now, I've created some quick styles already. And you'll see here I've got four styles. And these basically match up with that enum I created. So for standard store style, it's going to be one row by one column. Large will be two by two. Wide will be two by one. And obviously tall will be one by two. So we're going to need a mechanism now of how to assign the style to each grid view item based on the size of the product. Now, grid view is incredibly extensible in this regard. It's got things like selectors and templates and panels all over the place. You can customize the hell out of it. And thankfully, there's a property on the grid view called item container style selector, which I'll show you later on. And what this does is lets you provide a, some code that says, select the style for this product. So I've created one already. called Stall Style Selector. And here it's from Style Selector, which is something built into WinRT and XAML framework. And down here I've got four properties, which we, we, I'm going to populate with our styles that I've already created. And it's got one method here called Select Style Core. Now for every item in our grid, this method's going to be called. It's going to be past two things. The item, which in our case will be the product, the container, which will be the grid view item. Now we know our item is a product, so we can cast it just like that. And I'm just going to switch over the size of that product, which we assigned in our view model, and return one of those properties. So if it's a standard style, standard size, I'll return the standard style and so on. Very, very simple. You could do your business logic, I think, uh, around, say, featured or hero in here. But I think it's better to leave it in your view model and have these style selectors to be pretty dumb. They're pretty basic. So back to our store view. Right at the top here, I've already defined our store style selector as a resource on the page. I've given it a key. And here's where I wire those properties to XAML resources. So here, I'm assigning to the standard property the standard store item style I defined in styles.xaml, and I'm assigning it to that property. So now, when store style selector does its logic, it can return those properties for us, all those styles. So the last thing we really need to do is give that store style selector to the grid view itself. So as I said, this is through a property called item container, ooh, not item container style. So that item container style would be how you would define one, you know, a style for a <coughs> single, from, you know, basically for all containers. But I want item container style selector. Assign that as a static resource. Ah. So another productivity tip: if you're going to do any more Windows, any sort of Windows 8 development, get a copy of ReSharper. You get instant sort of IntelliSense over this, over like your resources. So there's our store style selector. Let's cross our fingers and spin this up and see what happens. Well, we've got different sizes, but it still looks pretty ugly in my regard. What I'd really like is to have that bottom one there wrapped up to the top and have it all like if you've seen the Windows Store app. It's quite, quite narrow, but it's all laid up and a really good masonry effect in my regard. So um, a variable size wrap grid has support for this. It's got a property called maximum rows or columns. So what this property does is basically defines how soon it'll stop wrapping. Now by default, it'll stop wrap, start, uh, sorry, start wrapping back up when it runs out of room. But we can say, you know, wrap a bit earlier than, than that. Now, it's called maximum rows or columns because this can only wrap one way. If you've got an orientation of horizontal, the property is essentially maximum columns. We are wrapping vertical, so it's maximum rows. 
So spinning this up, crossing our fingers again. And now we've got a, a decent sized grid. You know, it's laid out nicely, a good masonry style effect. We're following the golden ratio, so it looks quite pleasing. And so if you've seen the store app, this looks a lot like this. You know, we can feature content based off uh, you know, products being on special, products we want to sell a lot more of. And it looks a lot less like the sort of grid view that you spin up from your template. It's a pretty easy thing to do and pretty customizable. So I'm going to switch back. Cool. So as we saw, the grid view, this is a, a common control. You're going to use this a lot. You know, in basically two thirds of your pages, you're going to use grid view. Uh, obviously, it's best used for displaying grids of data, especially when they're grouped into things like you know, categories of food, <coughs> genres of music, types of stories, and so on. Uh, it's, as I said, it's incredibly customizable. Uh, I only showed you through there the, uh, you know, the way you can customize panels and selectors, but I think there's about five or six different types of selectors you can, you can give it uh, beyond just item container style selector. So, the next thing, semantic zoom. Can I get a show of hands who knows what semantic zoom is in Windows 8? Awesome. Okay. So this is the Herald app we built. Oops, right. This is the Herald app we built uh, a few months ago, and you might have seen it in the keynote on the huge 82-inch screen, which I was really glad to see worked. <laughs> um, now it's quite long. You know, there's a lot of content on this page, especially when it's quite big, um, and. If someone's really interested in something like technology, which is at the far end, we don't want that user having to swipe, swipe, swipe constantly. So a semantic zoom is a way that if you're on a touch screen, you can pinch. Uh, keyboard and mouse, you can use control plus minus. Or there's even a little minus button down in the bo bottom right here that zooms out and gives us a, a higher level overview of the same data. Now, it's not a, not a change of data in the same fact. It's just a you know, a 10,000 foot view of the same data. So now I can click technology and it zooms back in and technology. So on a tablet, that's really easy. You can just pinch, tap where you want to go. Uh, control scroll wheel, if you're on an on a actual desktop, works just as well. And from there, we can go back to featured. So I think this is like a, a really, really great control. Uh, it stands out from all of Windows competitors, and it makes apps a lot easier to use. I've seen a lot of apps in the uh, store lately that don't use this, and you have to swipe a lot, and it gets quite boring very quickly. So my opinion, really, is that if you've got a grid view like this that's grouped, and it's got you know more data than one page, it should have semantic zoom. Golden rule, always put it in there. So I'm going to show you how, how easy this is. So what I have in my demo at the moment, I went to GitHub and searched for what's now a prohibited term, Metro. And this is the, uh, the top 200 results, uh, top 200 repositories in GitHub that come back for the term Metro. And I've grouped this by the language that they're implemented in. And surprisingly, C Sharp's not that, there's more Python than C Sharp. So. <laughs> I think the term is being somewhat co-opted. So, back to our code. So again, this grid view looks very much similar to what we, we saw before. It's straight out of the templates. We've got our variable size wrap grid in there still. We've got our stack panel stacking things horizontally. We've got a header template and we have an item template. So we're starting from very much the same place we started before. So all the work is done through a control called, funny enough, semantic zoom. And I'll just position this in the second row of the grid. And semantic zoom has two really important properties. The first one, zoomed in view. You can guess what the other one's going to be, can't you? Okay. 
So we're going to take our existing grid view, the one we've already created. I've just minimized it there. And make that our zoomed in view. So we're going to reuse the work we've already got. We don't have to delete anything. We're just going to wrap it with another semantic zoom control. Um, only certain controls can do this. Uh, there's an interface in the framework called iSemantic Zoom Information, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful and a, even more of a headache to actually implement. But out of the box, list view base implements this, which means grid view and list views can work as zoomed in views and zoomed out views. So we're going to reuse, as I said, reuse our existing grid view. And now we're going to create another, funny enough, zoomed out view. We're going to implement this with a, a grid view. I'm going to give it an X name because I'm going to actually have need to refer to this in code. I'm going to call it zoomed out grid. I'm going to give it a padding of some funny numbers just so it fits with the existing grid. Uh, yeah. And the last thing is set an item template which I've already created and I'll go into in a minute. Okay, so that's basically all we've needed to do. Our grid's a lot simpler than the grid beforehand because we're not going to be doing grouping. We're not going to be doing lots of complex layouts. We're going to be simply binding this to a top level view. So um, in this example, it's you know, we're doing repositories, for GitHub, grouped by languages. So in our zoomed out view, we're just going to want the languages. We're not going to want to do complex layouts or anything like that. So the last part is where most people trip up. So this is the, uh, the code behind for that view. Um, and we're going to need to populate that grid view with some data. <coughs> now normally, I don't like doing this stuff in the code behind, but unfortunately there's no way around it. I'll go through why in a second. So we're going to set this item source to some data. Now if you've done any of this grouping data before, you've looked at the uh, file new template, you'll notice a class called collection view source at the top. Now what this does is that grid view, in order to, to do the grouping nice and easily, expects the data you've got to be in a, a common understandable format that, that grid view can just work with. So what collection view source does is takes your data from your view model and wraps it and mangles it and kind of pushes it into a format that grid view can understand. Um, it's a little frustrating, but that's basically what we need to do. So I've got one here called languages view source. I'm binding it to my languages, and I'm set to, setting some properties saying, yes, this data is grouped, and for each group, you can get its data from the repositories collection. We won't go into that too much, but we need to know that whenever you're doing grouped grids, collection view source is necessary, and it's even more necessary for semantic zoom. So when semantic zoom does its work, when you tap something at the top level view, it needs to understand where it's going to go when you actually tap it. So when you saw in the Herald, when I tapped technology, it zoomed in in the zoomed in view straight to technology. Now the way this works is through item equality. Basically, the same item at each end of on both bound to both grids, and the grid can work out where to go. You know, we're binding the same data on both sides. So we need to tap into what collection view source is doing. Collection view source is, as I said, mangling and wrapping that data and binding it to our zoomed in view. So we need to use that mangled, wrapped data in our zoomed out view. So back to our code. So we're going to set the item source to our, our zoomed out grid. And I said I collect, created a, our collection view source called languages view source. It's got a property called view. This is our, our mangled wrapped data. And it's got a prop, another property called collections, collection groups. So these are the groups of our mangled data, in this case, our languages. And now let's spin this up and take a look. Sweet. We can see all our languages here. 
we can tap into, say, shell, this shell here, back out, get a JavaScript. Now, semantic zoom can be, just, be more than just navigation. From, if I just look at this view right now, I can't see what all the languages are. I can't see that shell's even involved, or Python, or I guess you can see Python, but the others aren't there. So this zoomed out list can provide more information than just navigation. I can see now all the languages that are uh, actually involved in these repositories. So I want you guys to think about like what other data you can display in this zoomed out view rather than just simple boxes. Think about, you know, at this high level view, what else you can show. So I've got another data template here, which sort of illustrates this example. So all I've done is change the data template of our zoomed out grid. None of the other codes changed. And now we can see really quickly. It's worth an applause, surely. Come on. <laughs> what we can see at this point is, you know, what are the more popular languages? What's the breakdown of these repositories over different languages? We still get our navigation. I can still tap shell and get back into it. I, I, I could if you wanted to sort them. I think it's quite nice to get the little sort of skyscraper effect going. You know, so think about you know, when you're at this top level view, how can you present this information in sort of more visually interesting ways that it's not just about navigation, it's about you know, what can you show the user that makes it more interesting and more, more appealing. So takeaway from this is really think about the item templates and what you can actually display at this point. Let's switch back. So, so the semantic zoom control, it's pretty much unique to Windows 8. Uh, I haven't seen it used elsewhere. Other places use optical zoom quite a bit. You know, you zoom out, it's just the same stuff, just smaller. This is different. We're navigating to a different level of the same data. Um, as I said before, if your data is grouped, have semantic zoom. It's, I think, necessary because, I mean, you look at some, I think there's a couple of first party apps that are about, I think, like Xbox Live, I think, is one of them, that uh, it's about 40 screens long. You know, one of these monitors probably uh, in Wellington. <laughs> uh, and if you pinch it, you know, you can't pinch out. And if you want to see your Minesweeper score, it's like 20 feet that way. So always have this in here. Um, it's pretty much impossible to extend. We had a working demo of how to extend semantic zoom in the RTM, which just failed to compile and release, uh, re sorry, worked in release candidate, failed to work in RTM. But there is an interface. Uh, if you want to implement your own controls that interact with semantic zoom, there's an interface to work against. And I think there's a lot of scope for creativity in this. As we saw, you can be just more than blocks, use things like graphs, or uh, in Nigel's talk, he talked about um, say stock levels where it was red or green based on whether the stock's going up or down. You know, you can use it almost as a dashboard that if you zoom out, you've now got a dashboard of the data on your screen. Cool. cool. Any questions about semantic zoom before we go on? That's fine yeah. So the, the question was for them, is it easy to group by different attributes? Yep. Uh, so we basically, I'll just see if I can find the code for this. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, no. I may have it. So here we go. We've got this is some quick code. I'm loading up the data from a local local file, and I'm grouping the repositories here by language. Uh, so basically, all you'd want, all you'd have, is a button on your page to, to switch the group to something else and just requery that data, group it into something else, and rebind it to the group. There's nothing built into Grid View to switch the grouping. You're going to basically restructure your data. You'd have to switch it out. Uh, there's mechanisms already built into it, like that. Uh, some of the app, some of the other first-party apps, they'll typically have a button down in the bottom right, which changes the sort. So you pull the app bar up and say, "I want to sort by this now." And so on. Yep. So the question was, can you use semantic zoom over multiple levels? At the moment, you can't. It just defines a zoomed-in view and a zoomed-out view. 
and semantic zoom doesn't implement that interface. You can't sort of nest them together. Uh, I think it'd be interesting if you could, but the way they've kind of defined this idea of semantic zoom that it's not an optical one that you're just looking at the same information, that multiple levels may not be a good idea. Uh, if you look at the guidelines in MSDN around semantic zoom, they actually say don't change the scope. So if you're looking at, say, uh, a whole lot of pictures in the pictures app, when you semantic zoom out, it shouldn't change to, say, all the folders because that's not the same information. It's different information. Uh, what you want to do is stick with the same information at a higher level. Any other questions? So the grids, the question was, do the grids support dragging and dropping or uh, even whole groups and so on? So out of the box, grid view does support drag, drop, reordering and so on, uh, but not between uh, groups themselves. You have to implement, implement that yourself. But it has been done. I've got an app, which I don't think is installed on this machine, where you can drag and drop between groups and then use semantic zoom to zoom out and see all the groups. And then you can drag and drop those to rearrange the groups. So that works out quite nicely. Any other questions? Okay. We'll move on. Cool. So the last thing is async await. Uh, better people at this talk have talked at this uh, conference have talked about this, and I won't try and replicate it. Uh, I highly recommend Ivan's talk from yesterday. Uh, go check it out online. So what I'm going to talk about is basically some of the tips and tricks we discovered around async await. Uh, some of the gotchas that really bit us in the ass, and uh, yeah, some of the lessons we learned. So, in my application, I'm hooking up to uh, a method called unhandled exception. So this gets basically called whenever there's an unhandled exception in your class, in your application. If you've done any Silverlight or WPF, this is a pretty common concept. It's usually used as their sort of last resort that you haven't caught it anywhere else. Let's catch it here, to show a message box, and you know, pray we haven't broken things too much at this point. So I have a button here that throws an error. Simplest method I could write. And if we spin it up and hit it, that exception's thrown. It's passed to the unhandled exception handler, where we promptly handle it and display an error message. All is well. If I literally go through and do nothing else but add, the, yeah, add sync, async keyword to it, we get vastly different behavior. Who can guess what's going to happen? No? The button, the app just crashes. Boom. Unhandled exception doesn't get unhandled at all. And in the real world, when this is three layers deep inside some API call deserializing some garbage XML, it becomes very, very fun to try and work out what's going wrong. Yeah. So what the key takeaway here, what happens is basically in async void methods, when there's an unhandled exception, it doesn't get passed to the unhandled exception handler. Who would have seen that coming? What happens is it gets thrown onto the thread pool, and the process just goes <laughs> down really quick. So watch out for that. It even works in normal async await stuff. So below this, I have a method called do error. It's, it's an async method returning task. It waits a little bit, and then it throws an exception. And up here, I have an async void method, which is going to call that and await its results. So spinning this up, calling that, same thing happens. So what's actually happening here is on do work is calling do error. It's awaiting the result. We get an exception thrown. The await propagates that exception back up into on do work. On do works async void. So the exception goes onto the thread pool process goes kaboom. Not good. So the key takeaway here, and it took us a while, try catch everywhere. 
golden rule, anywhere there's an async void, you've got to have error handling, at probably at a global level. So stay away from async void as much as you can. Uh, but when you do need it, and you're going to need it a lot because things like button click handlers are a void by default, but their signature must be void. And if you're going to do any async stuff at that point, it's got to be async void. So anything off a button click, exceptions will take your process down. Not fun. So let's chuck this up to in our try catch. And I've got a method called. called display error. Now let's show you it. So this doesn't do much either. Creates a message dialog and so on. Much like our un unhandled exception handler, but we've just got it locally. Yay, we're back to not crashing our application. So this can get really tedious really quickly. You know, hunting down every async void, putting in try catches, dealing with the exceptions. So what I highly recommend is some sort of helper methods. Uh, I've got one here called handle errors. What this takes is a, if you can remember your delegates and so on, a function that returns a task. In this case, it'll be an asynchronous method. Uh, and I'm going to wrap that in a try catch and call display error if it throws an <coughs> exception. So this means that I can reduce this down to a method call to, to that handle errors. And I'm going to pass do error. It's that method that we were previously calling before, I'm passing it to handle errors. It's going to call it for me and wrap it in a try catch. So this way, your code becomes a little simpler. You're not repeating that try catch display error in every async void you need. Uh, this code will be available online later on if you can take a look at it. So I will call this again just to make sure. Great. So we're now wrapping our async task method with a method that's going to wrap that with try catch and call display errors for us. The other other gotcha, and this caught us all by surprise. So we'll switch back to our, our process crashing pattern, where I call do error directly. I'm not wrapping this with the try catch. I'm awaiting the results. The exception's going to bubble up and blow away our process. But later on, maybe I thought, well, do error is not actually giving us any results. Why do I care about actually awaiting it? Because it's just gonna, it's gonna do some stuff and there's nothing after do error, nothing down here that it's expecting do error to have done its work yet. So why await it? Why not just call it? Who can guess what's gonna happen? No, it's not gonna block. That's the wrong one. Nothing. My code works. Ooh. <laughs> the exception is effectively swallowed. You just don't see it. And so your code could be like catastrophically falling down behind the scenes, but your UI just doesn't see it coming. So it's all about the await keyword. By awaiting this method, that's what bubbles the exception from do error up into do work. If you don't await it, that exception doesn't bubble, it just gets swallowed. You don't see it coming. So the other takeaway here, if your method returns task, please await it or you're just not going to see what's coming. You know, you, you're going to spend a day writing all this code, you're going to spin it up, you know, it's working. You know, the app's not crashing. Uh, and behind the scenes, no. Nah. OK. You want to switch back to the demo? Yeah, cool. Sorry. So async await, fantastic. Uh, as other guys have said, you're going to need to know how to, to use these keywords uh, when building Windows 8 applications. Uh, 
the WinRT team d decided that anything in the WinRT library that could take longer than 50 milliseconds would only be asynchronous. So that means disk access, network access, GPS access, uh, even things like create a tile, show a message dialog. These are all asynchronous things. Uh, so you're going to need to know async away. Uh, and think about what's going to happen with your exceptions in these methods. If it's an async void and an exception bubbles out of it, your process is just going to die. So make sure in every async void, have a try catch or have some mechanism for handling errors. Key takeaway. And that awaiting async methods that return task is how, the, how exceptions bubble through your asynchronous work. If you don't await it, your exceptions are just going to disappear. And you think you're going to be doing really well. So that's the important stuff, really. All righty. My turn again. So um, I'll just show you something quickly that uh, is interesting in Windows 8 as opposed to Windows Phone 8. And that is um, the, the style applied to the application. Now, um, this device has a theme selected, a dark theme with a, with a highlight. Um, but the highlight that is selected by the user is nothing to do with the highlight that's shown in the app. So if we run that app, we go to this theme controls page. There's a whole bunch of purple there. Okay, when I select things and I hover over them, select drop downs, there's all these purple things going on. And where's that purple coming from? And if you, I don't know if you can see it, it's very subtle, but as I hover over things, the purple changes slightly. It's not actually an overlay, it's actually a different shade of purple in there. Okay. And no matter what you do with um, the control panel and you change your apps, your computer's theme, that purple doesn't change. And you, can't, you can't get at it. So if you've got a really cool app with a nice, um, you know, maybe metro orange theme to it, um, it's, this purple goes everywhere and it's really glaringly obvious. And we were struggling to work out how to fix it, but we, we found out how. So, so where does it come from? That's the first thing. Let's have a look and see where that's, being, where that's coming from. So it is, um, it is part of the build. We don't know if it comes from this file or whether it, it is um, included in the build, but you can find the colors if you go into this wonderful folder. It's Program Files, Windows Kits, 8.0, Include, WinRT, XAML, Design. There you go. Remember that? Who can remember that? And we'll test later. <laughs> and in there is this little file called Theme Resources. I'm just going to open Visual Notepad. And, oh look, it's highlighted for me, that's cool. But um, if you have a look, there's a bunch of colors in here. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of colors. Okay, and there's thicknesses, there's color brushes, there's highlights, all sorts of stuff. So I, that, that um, maybe that indeterminate progress bar there, I want to fix up and make orange. So let's go and find progress bar here. Okay. Progress by indeterminate foreground theme brush. Cool. So I can grab that. Next one. Yeah, there we go. Indeterminate. Yep. Yeah, I can grab that and I can read that. Um, I can read that hex and that's purple. Can anyone read hex? No. no I have a guess. That looks a little bit like purple. So I'm going to say, well, let's take that and let's go and put it in my app and try and fix it. Let's fix that that thing. So let's go and find the styles. App. App. Xaml. Oh, yeah, that's right. You can tell Nigel is the one that knows what's going on here, right? And in here, I've got some brushes in there. There's my orange, orange brush and my orange color, okay? So I want to say, well, let's make the indeterminate foreground theme color, and we'll take that orange from up there, metro orange. Or let's be better about that and say static resource metro orange. Okay, and run that up. And we'll see if it fixes it, we'll see if we get rid of the purple. Yay, got rid of the purple on one element. Hey, it's purple everywhere else. I've managed to fix that one thing. So my choices are, uh, my one choice is go through and find every, th every instance of that purple and copy it out and put it into my app. There's really no simple way around it. So what is simple, though, is there is a cool tool that has been produced by the Code52 guys which helps us with this. So... Let's go back. Well, let's grab that theme resources and copy it. Okay. 
Let's paste it in here. Replace. So just to show you, I have actually replaced the theme resources. There's an app in here called hammerpants.exe. Don't ask me how they named it. But if I open a command prompt here, go hammer, right? It's a little app that takes a color input and a input file and will produce an output. Okay, so if I say hammerpants slash color, right? You can tell it's written by Australians because the color's spelt right. Uh, and I grab my metro color, which is not the alpha part of it, just the, the, the correct the web part of it. Okay, color equals that. And there. That's it. And input file equals the theme resources that I copied from that deep dark directory. Did I spell that right? No. Thank you. And hit enter. And it did something. Okay? So let's go back and have a look what it did. It created a file called generic.xaml. You can look at that with Notepad. And if we go and hunt down that color I just, just did, there it is. Okay? And the cool thing is, slight variants of that color are also in there. So it's, it's setting my color everywhere, and it's also setting a slight variant overlay color and that sort of thing as well. So then I can take that generic XAML, and hopefully paste it into here. Right, so there's generic XAML in there. And then include it in my app as a I'll get rid of this, this one here. And just include it along with all my other resource dictionaries. Again, ReSharper lets you actually auto-complete file names within your um, app. Really, real helper there. And we'll run that up. Fingers crossed it does what it should do. Yay! Okay, so that's a really cool little, tiny little thing, but a real lifesaver. So you can basically design your app, get your designer or, or you know, your color person. You can visit colorlovers.com, find a good color scheme, and then you can choose that highlight color out of there and run hammer pants, and it'll apply it to everything. So that was just a tip. Cool. So um, just summing up some tools and resources we showed you there. Um, Nigel is gonna, has got all the demos up in his bit bucket. Um, XAML Spy is a godsend. You need a XAML Spy or a straight edge ruler to hold up to your screen. Um, Metro Studio is a cool place to get a bunch of its icons. I think it's it's icons for yeah. your app bars and so on. So it's a great tool to if you want to build custom icons uh, in different colors, different sizes, everything you're going to need around like sort of icon iconography. Uh, Metro Studio is where you go. And Hammer Pants, which I just showed you. Yeah. So um, just summing up, you know, you can take questions as well, but um, we showed the default templates, what was good, what was bad, uh, showed how, how the grid worked. Um, Nigel showed... Semantic Zoom. Grid view. Yep. Uh, semantic Zoom, use it, love it, put it everywhere. Yep. Async await, basically you know, what you need to do to deal with all the errors you're going to make, because believe me, you're going to write lots. Cool. And Thank me. you. Yeah, thanks everyone. We'll, we can take some questions now. We'll also be at the Nokia stand during lunchtime. We're really friendly. Just contact us on Twitter or email or anything. Email Marco, Marco Studio, Marco Metro, and we'll, we'll help you out. Cool.